Good morning. Good morning. We've got a little bit of a smaller crowd this morning. That's all right. Many people have already left or are heading out for their Thanksgiving breaks. We also have a group of people who are in the back right now getting everything ready for the luncheon. It's going to be after the service. So hopefully you can stay and join us for that. We've got some wonderful food back there. And uh, it's going to be a great, great Sunday. Uh, but I want to welcome you. Thank you for coming. So glad you came to join us for worship, and since we do have a smaller crowd, that just means you're going to have to sing that much louder this yes. morning, right, Lance? Yep. All right, let's worship this morning. All right, let's get to it. Let's look. Let's say this as we start worship this morning. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living. Whatever men may say, I see His hand of mercy. I of cheer, and just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to Thanksgiving. 
Now, just a couple of notes. Please remember that the Women's Fellowship is coming up on the 30th. Also, very quickly, we're going to have our VBS. We didn't get to do it in the summer, so we're doing it at Christmas time. So we're beginning to plan that. If you'd like to help, uh, please see myself or uh, Miss Angela. We're going to start the process of getting all that ready. And, and as we looked at and watched the video last week, our Lonnie Moon Christmas offering goal for this year is $1,000. So hopefully we will reach that goal with your help. And that's such a wonderful thing because that's money that goes straight to the missionaries. It doesn't go all these other places. It goes to the missionaries who are on the field sharing the gospel of Christ all around the world. All right, Brother Robert, come, come read our verse for this morning. say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, please bless those gathered here today to have a positive influence on the world, to show you in their lives. Please help people in the trying times of the holidays coming up, which has historically been a depressing time for many, and this will probably be more trying than most. Help us to be faithful and share with each other and God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Thank you, Brother Robert. Let's stand and sing as we continue in worship this morning.
See, my thought is, since we're eating here at church, that means I can keep you as long as I need to, right? Got some knocks, got some shakes, got some laughs. I know what it is. It's warm. That's why. Is anybody else a little warm? Yes. Yes, okay. All right. If we could get somebody to kick that air on, that might wake us up a little bit this morning. There you go. There you go. Yes, sir. All you have to do is just punch the arrow button until it goes down. About 63? That cool enough for everybody in here? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We're continuing our study this morning from good to great. And we're asking that question, what does it take to go from good to great? Now, we mean that for our church, but that can also be for your Sunday school, for your family, for you yourself and your personal walk with Christ. What is it that you need to move from good, which isn't bad, to great, which is better than good. What do we need? Last Sunday we started this series off, and we looked at the very first thing that we need is prayer. Now we talked about joy, and we talked about patience, and we need those things as well. But first and foremost, it all starts with prayer. There's been no awakening, no revival, no great turning to the Lord that has happened unless it has been preceded by prayer. After our service, or at the end of our service last Sunday, we ended with a challenge. And I challenged you to call someone that you haven't seen necessarily in a while, or that you hadn't talked to in a while, and ask them what you could pray for them about. Now it warms my heart that many of you took that challenge to your heart and you called somebody. And I'm so thankful that you did. If you didn't, that's okay. It's never too late. It is always appropriate time to call someone and to pray for them. So I want to encourage everyone to continue, or maybe to start for the first time, to pray for our church. Pray for our members. Pray for our teachers, our leaders, our deacons, our staff. Pray for our guests and our visitors. Let's lift one another up. Not for our own sake, and not so that we could be like this church or that church, but that we would glorify God in all that we do. That we would reach the lost, the sick, and the hurt with the gospel. That we ourselves and those around us, our brothers and sisters, would grow in Christ. Amen. And that God would use this church. And that we would see Him working and not our own. Amen. So that's our prayer. It seemed appropriate that we should pray. So let's do that. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we look at this series from good to great, I pray that you would draw to our mind, draw to our heart, draw to our attention the things that are keeping us from greatness. And not greatness of ourselves, greatness in you, our Lord. Father, I pray that as a church you would lift us up, that you would lead us and that you would guide us by your word, Father. And I pray that we would be a praying church that loves you and that trusts you and that seeks you with all things in prayer. Father, lift up those who are not with us, those who are sick, those who are hurting. Be with our brother Mike. And put your hand of healing upon him, Lord. Father, we love you and praise you. In Christ's name. Now, it occurred to me, as I was putting this sermon together, that we actually didn't stop and define what great is. We said going from good to great, but what is great? See, we all have a different definition of what that might be and what that might look like. And I want to clear some of that up. When I say going from good to great, I do not mean that we look like this church or that church or that church or that church. 
Not that we sing this way or have this style of worship. Not that the preacher preaches in this manner. Not that we have this program or this event. None of that. That's what, not what I'm talking about when I talk about going from good to great. It's not about certain numbers or even our finances. As we go through this series, we're going to define what a great church looks like. As we answer that question, what do we need to go from good to great, we're also answering the question, what does a great church look like? So to put it this way, last Sunday, our first Sunday of this series, we talked about prayer. How if we're going to go from good to great, it needs to be on the foundation and the first step of prayer. So we can say a great church is a praying church, can't we? So as we go through these things, we're defining what a great church looks like. And each Sunday at the beginning, I'm going to do just a short recap of that. And I kind of like your help in that. So what I'll do is I'll say, a great church looks like, or I'm sorry, a great church is a, and then you'll answer, a praying church. Excellent. All right, some of you already jumped on board. If you're a little slow, that's okay. I'm going to give you another chance right here. A great church is a praying church. A praying church. We're going to look at that second step this morning. Another characteristic that we need to move from good to great, and it's called brokenness. So if you'll stand in honor of reading God's Word, we're going to read one short verse, but we're going to look at many things in this passage. Psalms 51, verse 17. David writes, the sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. God, you will not despise a broken and humble heart. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, may you be glorified in the reading of your word. And may we be convicted from its truth. Open our eyes. Open our hearts, open our minds that we might see the sin that we have let slide and reside in us. And break our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. <clears throat> the number one thing that interferes with our relationship with the Lord. Indeed, the biggest problem that we all face, and I say the, the one problem that the world has is this little thing called sin. Sin. And so we're going to talk about being broken. This psalm, Psalm 51, was written by David, King David. It's a very special psalm that if you read not uh, prior to verse 1, even though it's a part of the original language there, it says a Davidic psalm when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone to Bathsheba. So just to recap, if you don't remember your Old Testament, that's all right. King David was a good king and is described as a man after God's own heart, but King David didn't always do the right thing. And King David was not with his men out doing battle and war. He was up on his house enjoying life. And he looked down and he saw a woman who was bathing. And instead of averting his eyes, instead of running out of there, he stopped, he sat down, and he watched her, and he lusted after her. And so he took Bathsheba, he committed adultery. After that, he wanted to cover up what had happened, for she became pregnant. So he brought her husband, Uriah, home, and Uriah, being a good man, refused to even go into his house. He says, my brothers are out there fighting. Why should I be in the comfort of my bed? And he slept outside. So King David came up with another plan. He sent him back with the very letter that would kill him. He gave it to his commanding officer, which told him, Put Uriah in the fiercest part of the battle, 
And when it gets really rough, pull everyone back except for him. And he died in battle. So not only did King David commit adultery, not only did he lie and try to cover this up, but he also committed murder. And that's where we find King David. The prophet Nathan came and convicted him. We're going to look at several different ways when we're confronted with our sin that we respond. See, we have a lot of different responses. We're not going to cover them all. We can't cover them all. There's a whole bunch that we, uh, you know, I, I can't even think of, but we're going to cover the main ones that the Lord brought to my attention. One of the main ways that we confront our sin, when, one of the main ways we respond, excuse me, when we're confronted with our sin, is that we lie. We can be liars. How many of you have ever told a lie in your life? If you didn't raise your hand, you just told one. <laughs> we lie. There are several different ways that we lie about our sin. Number one, we say that we haven't sinned. That we have not sinned. It was in our scripture reading. Amazing how it's orchestrated that way. But 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. All of us have sinned. All of us make mistakes. All of us are not perfect. There was a pastor one day after preaching came down and there's a man who met him and said, Preacher, I want you to understand that I haven't sinned in the last 10 years. And the preacher turned his gaze and he began to scan the room. The man said, Preacher, did you hear me? I said, I have not sinned in 10 years. Isn't that remarkable? The preacher continued to look around searching for someone. Finally, the man said, what are you looking for? Who, who is it you're looking for? The preacher said, well, sir, I'm looking for your wife, because I bet she has a different story. <laughs> One of the ways we lie is that we say we have no sin. It's just not true. God's word is true. If you say you are without sin, the Bible itself calls you. Another way we lie is that we hide from it. It's a natural action and reaction for us to run from our sin. You see it very explicitly in children, right? When they get in trouble and they're standing before you, what do they want to do? They want to hide their face. They want to sweep it under the rug. They want to pretend like it hasn't happened. In essence, to lie. When we live with unrepented sin in our hearts, it's like saying we haven't sinned. We're trying to hide from it, but it's really just a lie. Another way we lie about our sin is that we reason or we justify. We're excellent at this, right? Why did you react that way? Well, you don't understand, Pastor. She said this, or he did that, or you would not believe how they treated me. We justify our sin. As many times as I've read the Bible through, as many times as I've gone into, uh, and, and gotten into God's Word and looked into the Scriptures, I've not found yet to this day the verse that says, when this happens or that happens, then it's okay and you can treat people this way. One of my favorite verses that I would use with the youth often comes from Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. We can reason and justify with the best of people, with the greatest of lawyers. But the truth is, we're lying. So one of the ways we respond to our sin is that we lie. Another way that we respond to our sin is with apathy. 
And this is probably one of the most horrible responses to find in ourselves. And it should be the scariest. To know of our sin, to know that it's wrong, and just not to care. To not have any concern for it. This is where David was. You see, David was living in a sin. He knew it. Trust me, you can't do what David did and then forget about those things. It will be there in your mind. He knew it was wrong. He tried to cover it up and tried to hide it and then committed another wrong. But he didn't respond in a godly way. He was apathetic to his sin. You see, it wasn't until Nathan came and the conviction of God rested on his heart that David finally was broken. Many times we find ourselves apathetic of our own sin. You see, because sin blinds us. Sin hardens our heart. It's like a callus. If you've ever played the guitar before, or excuse me, if you haven't played the guitar before and you pick it up and you begin to play, your fingers will hurt because your fingers tips are very tender and those are not strings of cotton, are they? <laughs> They're made of steel or wire or something else. I don't know. I don't know the actual material. The point is, is they're hard. And it hurts your fingers. And you have to play for a long period of time before you develop calluses on your fingers. And then you don't feel it as much. Sin is that way. It builds calluses upon our heart. And it blinds us to our sin that we become apathetic. When we see this response in ourselves, what we need is conviction. Conviction is the role of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 8, when He comes, speaking of the Helper, speaking of the Holy Spirit, when He comes, He will convict the world about sin, about righteousness and judgment. And God uses His Word to bring about conviction in our life. I can't tell you how many times I've opened up God's Word to spend my daily time with Him, and a verse jumps out and strikes me right in the face. Because I needed to hear that. We see this throughout, God, uh, throughout Scripture. Examples are from uh, the Old Testament are like Josiah. You remember the story of Josiah, who was a very young king. He became king over Israel. The king before him that preceded him was very wicked. Josiah was a godly king. At the beginning of his rule, they found a copy of God's Word in the temple. And he ordered that it be read. And when they read God's word, he and the people's hearts were broken. Because they felt the conviction of God upon them. The revival broke out. Revival will never break out. All there is callous, unrepented sin in our hearts. Nehemiah, when he was rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem, he assembled the people and he would have the scriptures read for three hours every day. Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 3 says that they would read it for three hours and then they would confess and praise God for three hours. How many of you are thankful? I'm not going to make you stay here for six hours. <laughs> They were broken. They were convicted by God's word of the sin in their life. And they confessed and they praised. A third way that we respond to sin in our life is that we try to pay for it. We try to make up for our sin. We try to do so many good works, good acts, to make up for the bad ones. This is completely contrary gospel, which says there is nothing that you can do to pay for your sin. If you could pay for your sin, then why 
was Jesus crucified. If you could pay for all the wrongdoing in your life, then what was the point of Jesus giving his life for you? You cannot pay for your own sin. Verse 16, David says in Psalms 51, You do not want a sacrifice, or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. David said, Lord, if you wanted that, I would pay it. But that's not what God wanted. I wanted a broken spirit, a humble heart. So fourthly, and correctly, the response we should have is brokenness. Brokenness isn't slight. Brokenness isn't light. It gives pain like a broken bone would. Psalms 32, the Psalms of forgiveness. David writes, verse 3 and 4, When I kept silent, my bones became brittle, for my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, and my strength was drained as in the summer's heat. This is a picture of true remorse. Remorse of sin, and not for the punishment. See, there's a difference there. Being remorseful for the act, and then being remorseful for the repercussions. Like I've, I've disciplined my kids enough, and you can see it in, in most kids, whether or not they are truly sorry for their wrongdoing, or that they're sorry they got caught. There's a difference there, isn't it? When a child comes and confesses to doing something, you had no clue that they had did it. That's when you see true remorse, brokenness over what they did. And humility and brokenness over our sins are signs of genuine confession. We have a beautiful picture here in Psalm 51 of brokenness from David. So let's look at what David did. The first thing that David did when Nathan came when Nathan convicted him, is that he turned to God. Verse 1, Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion. Blot out my rebellion. This entire psalm is a prayer to the Lord that came from the conviction of sin in his life. David didn't run from his problems. David didn't hide from it. David didn't lie to himself. David didn't try to pay for it. He turned to God. Isn't it ironic that the very thing that we need, the Lord, is often the thing that we try to run from? See, you can always turn to God. No matter how grievous your sin is, you can always trust Him. You can always come to Him. For God accepts What our verse this morning is all about. The sacrifice of pleasing to God is a broken spirit. God, you will not despise a broken and a humble heart. God is pleased with us when we come to Him in humility, in remorse, and repent. So David turned to God. But he also confessed his sin. Now to confess means to say the same thing. Simply to agree with God. If God says that's wrong, it's wrong. And nothing will ever make it right. It doesn't matter what society says. It doesn't matter what the entertainment industry says. It doesn't matter what the news says. If God says this is wrong, it's wrong. And if God says this is right, then it's right. Confess is to agree with Him. It's to come before Him and say, God, I did this and it was wrong. See, the opposite of that is pride. God doesn't accept a proud heart. God accepts a humble heart. First step of this is to acknowledge it. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. All have sinned. 
1 John chapter 1, as we've already read this morning, says that if we have, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. Acknowledge your sin. And when we acknowledge it, we don't make light of it. You ever met someone who tries to make light of any problem that comes their way? Oh, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, it is. That's a big deal. I remember early on when Anna was expecting our fourth child. People came to me and they said, oh, it's no big deal. I said, yeah, it is. <laughs> we have to get a whole new car. <laughs> I, make it, I make light of it, and I shouldn't. But when we acknowledge our sin, we don't make light of it. We see the seriousness in it. Sin is rebellion against God. James chapter 1 verse 15 says, Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Sin never leads to something good. Only to something good. There's an old saying, you've probably heard it before, but I'm going to repeat it because it bears repeating. Sin will take you farther than you wanted to go, keep you longer than you wanted to stay, and cost you more than you were willing to pay. Sin is serious. Billy Graham considered sin so serious that when he was in Europe, which was known very much at that time to have scantily clad people on the TV. He went into his hotel room, and the plug for the TV actually went inside the wall. You couldn't just simply unplug it from the socket. And he pulled that cord as it tore a hole all the way up to the ceiling and finally broke out. And the men that were with him were astonished. I said, Billy, what? How could you? How could you tear up the hotel room? He said, Men, the cost to fix that is so much smaller than the cost it would to sin. He took sin serious. Acknowledge it. Step two is to repent. Repent is just a fancy word. It means to do a 180. It means you're going in this direction and you stop and you turn and you go in the complete opposite direction. Someone who confesses a sin turns around and does it no more. Again, I use children as example. They're just wonderful generators of illustration. <laughs> But a child you know, will do something wrong, and then they'll say they're sorry, and then what do they do? They turn right around and they do it again, right? Were they really sorry? No. That's not repentance. So confess your sins. Acknowledge it. Repent. Turn away from them and do them no more. And then thirdly, pray for forgiveness and cleansing. Listen to David's words in his Psalms. Verse 6. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self. You teach me with wisdom deep within. You purify me with this off, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sins. Blot out all my guilt. God, create in me a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and give me a willing spirit. Then, will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. David sought the Lord because David knew that the Lord was the only one that he could turn to. 
There's no one else that can forgive. There's no one else who can save. There's no one else who can heal, who can cleanse. The Lord can. And David cries out. He says, have mercy on me. Wash the sin away from me. Purify me, Lord. Create a clean heart in me, God. Only God can do that. Only God can cleanse us. And David said, create a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit. And when he knew he didn't, he didn't need just a fix-up, a tune-up. He knew he needed a total overhaul. He wasn't asking for an improved heart, a stronger heart. He was asking for a new heart. We see a wonderful and a beautiful picture of brokenness in David. One who turns to God, one who confesses his sin, and one who seeks the Lord in prayer for forgiveness and cleansing. Anyone who has experienced the joy of God's salvation knows that it's both real and unspeakable. And when we let sin creep in, when we let sin reside in our heart, and we don't confess it, we don't repent from it, we let it reside there, we say we have no sin in our heart, the Lord's hand is heavy upon us. We get a hard heart, we get calluses. We need brokenness. And He, and He alone, can do it. And he, and He alone, can restore us. If we're going to go from good to great, then we cannot live with unrepented sin. We need brokenness. Because the truth is, this church is not perfect. often been told throughout seminary, throughout ministry, heard it over and over again. Said, if you ever find the perfect church, don't go there. You'll mess it up. Yeah. <laughs> we are not a perfect church. We have unrepented sin. And we need brokenness. You see, for a great church, it's one that is broken over sin. Not accepting it. Now I don't stand up here <clears throat> pretending that I'm perfect. Pretending like I'm the only one who, who, who doesn't need confession and all of you do. I'm part of that problem too. Because I'm sinful. And I make mistakes. I need brokenness in my heart, in my heart. Would you come? Would you turn to him? Would you soften your heart? Would you experience that wonderful, amazing joy that comes when God doesn't reject you? God doesn't spit you out. God doesn't toss you to the side. God doesn't give up on you. God sees your brokenness. like to come and pray. If you'd like for me to pray with you, I'd love to. But as he calls, will you come?
Amen, amen. I want to challenge you this week. Take some time, get alone, search your heart, and ask the Lord, is there any sin that I have left unconfessed? Is there any wrongdoing I have been hiding from myself, lying to myself about? And then confess it and turn back to the Lord. I hope you'll stay and join us for lunch. I don't know if we have any special instructions or not, but we will find out from Miss Angela when we get back there. Uh, let's uh, end our service, and uh, please remember we have no activities this week because of Thanksgiving. Have a safe and wonderful Thanksgiving. Okay. Blessed be the name.